The blade screeched and glanced away, tearing the orc's tunic and shirt, but not the skin underneath. The red axe threw its arms around him and clasped him in a bear hug. Meanwhile, gouging at his throat, or gouging at his throat and face with the tusk juttering upward from its lower jaw. For some reason, it thrusted it. For some reason, it trusted that wouldn't kill him either, or else it, it in its excitement, it had forgotten the object was to take him alive. Whatever it had in mind, Aaron was sure he had only seconds to break free before it blinded him or winced the flesh off his skull. He wrestled frantically, holding its boar-like teeth away, trying to loosen its grip. Grimly certain that most of the tricks he might ordinarily have tried in such a predicament, a headbutt, biting a knee to the groin, wouldn't deter the magically armored orc. His strain to fling him down beneath, in, beneath it onto the ground. Aaron could feel his balance going, and with a last frenzied effort, he tore himself away from it. They both came back on guard at the same time. The orc whipped the club at his head. He ducked, stabbed the underside of its wrist, and fell to break the skin. As before, by committing an attack, he'd merely opened himself up for the Red Axe's re reposit. He had to snatch his foot back to keep the scimitar from chopping it in two. Aaron broke from, for, no, Aaron Broke for another idea. He wasn't confident of the one that just came to him, but it was all he had. He ducked, dodged, parried, and gave ground while he waited for the chance to try. He knew a few obscene taunts in the orc tongue and grasped them out of hopes of further angering his adversary and so undermining the creature's judgment. The red axe charged and swung the cudgel. Aaron lunged in close, avoiding, avoiding to strike in the process. He didn't bother to thrust out out the knife in another futile attack. Instead, he dropped. He dropped it to free up his hands. He lifted me. He shifted behind the orc and kicked it in the knee. The, the assault likely would have lamed an ordinary foe. He was sure it had, hadn't hurt the Red Axe, but it did cost the creature its balance. The orc stumbled, and Aaron threw himself on its back and bore it to the ground. Using his weight, Aaron, found, or Aaron fought to hold the orc down. He grabbed its neck and squeezed. It heaved 
and thrash trying to buckle him off. Once or twice it nearly succeeded, but then it stro its struggles grew weaker, as he hoped, though the potion's magic kept its flesh from being pierced or pulled. It couldn't stop Aaron from pressing its windpipe close and cutting off the air. Eventually, the red axe stopped squirming. Aaron choked the orb for a few more seconds just to be sure, then let go. His hands ached. Are you alright, Mar Mary asked. He turned at some point in the last minute or so. She disposed of the knob, which lay, which lay on the ground behind her with a deep cut on the left side of its chest. Yes, Aaron replied, panting, and from the look of it, you are too. He rose and hurried to the fallen hobgoblin, Mary followed. To Aaron's relief, the slave was still breathing, and though he was no healer, speaking to it and putting its hairy big nose face su sufficed to restore it to consciousness. How are you? Aaron asked. The hobgoblin sat up and rubbed its head. I've had worse, it said. My people are hard to kill. I reckon so, Aaron replied. He took out some gold and pressed into the goblin Ken's hands. Plainly, you have more grit than those others. Can you make sure they get to the barony of the great oak before you strike out on your own? I can if you get these cross bolts out of my shoulder. I know Chirurgian, uh, Chirurgian, Mary said, kneeling down beside it and drawing her knife. But I've done this a time or two. With, when none was available, let me. It made Aaron wince to watch her cut the quarrel out. The hobgoblin, however, bore it stoic stoically. Only its clenching jaw revealed how much it was hurting. Once Mary bandaged, bandaged the puncture as best she could with strips of cloth, the, the former slave gave the two humans a nod, then hauled itself to its feet in appropriate appropriated the strangled orc's scimitar. It gnawed at its fellow thralls and said, What are you all standing around for? Loot the bodies in the shack. We want weapons, coins, and any clothes that aren't bloodstained. You've got three minutes. Move. Aaron turned to Mary and asked, Do you feel up to, the, to wrecking another of Kesha's operations? Why not? She sniffled, and the, she sniffled the breeze and said, We've got, we still got a while before it rains. Let's salvage my arrows. Leave your mark on the wall and move on. Sometimes the red axes struck 
driver spat on Nikos as they passed by the chair to which he was tied. But no one had made a serious, sustained effort to torture him since they decided he really didn't know where Aaron was hiding or where he'd stashed the strongbows. Still, it hardly mattered. His body screamed with the memory of the agony Sephiroth's un... Uh, Euthrax had inflicted on him. He thought he'd understood pain. It had, after all, been his constant companion since the night the master of the caravan from Inner Lith caught him trying to steal a cartload of valuable rugs. Instead of turning him over to the Grey Blades, the merchant decided to meet out his own form of justice. The guards beat Nikos, then hanged him. Miraculously, the nose did the 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 noose didn't kill him. He, da he dangled for hours, slowly strangling, yet enduring until friends found him and cut him down. To suffer, hobble, and silently curse his infirmities forever after, or rather, until just then. Nikos thought that after the torment Sephiroth had inflicted on him, if he somehow managed to escape Kesk's mansion alive, he'd never, even in the privacy of his own thoughts, complain of his everyday afflictions again. He must have passed over for, he must have passed out for a while because suddenly, or so it seemed to him, the long row of windows shone with the soft silver light of a rainy morning. Despite the grime on the panes to say nothing, of his own distress, the cloudy sky and rippling wet river was lovely and lifted his spirits for just a moment. Then his garments, no, then her garments wet and dripping Sephiroth's stalk into the solar and any semblance of peace or ease and Nico's soul died in a spasm of terror. I, he hated himself for feeling so afraid, but after what she put him through, he couldn't help, help it. Toward the end, had it been possible, might even have betrayed Aaron to make it stop. To his relief, the monastic ignored him to focus on Kest. Slouching in his golden chair with his battle axe across his knee and a half-eaten sausage in his fist. Well, the Tanaron snapped through a mouthful of meat. I haven't found him yet, Sephiroth replied. She ought to have been feeling a chill, but if so, Nico saw no sign of it in her manner. Well, he found us, Keskin said. He stole some of my slaves and killed the Red Axes who tried to stop him. Hurt and robbed two more whose job 
it was to collect protection coin along the docks. Burned a wine shop. I operated on, on board a barge. Didn't even try to steal the till. Just destroyed the place. He's sending you a message, Sephiroth said. Kesk trembled and his eyes shone red. That I have his father. But he can hurt me too by interfering with my business, said the tanner. I understand. I'm not a fool. The question is what to do about it. The same thing we have been doing, Hunt. We've already seen how pitiful you are at that. If the tainted, nettled, separate, or if the taunted, nettled, separate, Necro, Nikos couldn't tell that. No. If the taunt nettled Sephiroth, Nikos couldn't tell that. Either. She remained as calm as ever, as composed as she's she'd been throughout the torture and the amputation of his finger. Aaron only escape me. Aaron only escaped me by a fluke, she said. It won't happen again. So you say, I never should have trusted an outsider. I'm better able to handle this chore than are your underlings. You may recall that I proved that by defeating three of them at once. In any case, you still want the jewels, don't you? If so, let me break my fast and sleep for a day and for an hour or two. Then I'll return to the search. I imagine we'll have it. Aaron in hand before we see another sunrise. I don't want you... I don't want you relaxing just yet. Have another go at the old man. Nikos cringed, straining against the bonds. His chair rocked and bumped against the floor. If he had anything to tell us, Sephri said, we would have heard it already. His only use is as bait. Nikos prayed Cass would believe her and relent, but everything he'd seen or heard about the outlaw chieftain suggested otherwise. And sure enough, I don't care if he's got nothing to say. I want to hear him squeal. I promised Aaron we'd make the, fa his, make the father pay for the son's treachery, and so we will. The monastic inclined her head. As you wish, she said as she advanced on Nikos. Nikos fought the urge to squinch his eyes shut or twist his head away. His fingertips wandered about his body, pressing here and there. No, her fingertips wandered about his body, pressing here and there. She didn't seem to strain or exert any extraordinary force, yet the sensation was excruciating. Nikos prayed for her to ask some questions that would stop the pain for at least a moment. When she didn't bother, 
she still cried out the lies he hoped would satisfy her. No, he still cried out the lies he hoped would satisfy her. They didn't though, and before long, he was screaming wordlessly instead. He didn't know how long the torture continued, long enough for him to shriek his throat raw and reduce his already ruined voice to the thinnest of whispers. In his disorientation, he didn't know precisely when it stopped, just eventually realized that at some point, for some reason, it had. He sucked in a ragged breath, blinked the tears from his eyes, and peered about Sephiroth. And, and peered about Sephiroth was backing away from him. By the looks of it, she meant to take up a position with a couple of red axes who were loitering around. Nikos didn't understand it. Kess didn't either. She glowered at the slender monastic. No, he glowered at the slender monastic in her robe and hood. His stare demanded an explanation. Sephiris provided one in an ambiguous sort of way. She touched a finger to her lips, then pointed at the door. Kesk looked where she uh, bade him. For a moment, there was nothing to see, and he almost seemed to swell with impatience. Then a small figure sauntered into view. The newcomer wore a dark green camlet mantle, lightweight, but vol voluminous, and a hood like the one Sephiris used to shadow her features and cover her shaped skull. He wrapped a knit minister scarf around the lower part of his face. A low abiding person might have thought the stranger a menacing figure, but Nikos had spent his life among folk who were masked of one sort or another. To his eye, the newcomer, who didn't carry himself like a warrior or bravo, was, except for himself, the least fearsome person in the room. But Kesk and Sephiris eyed the stranger as if they knew something their prisoner didn't as if leery of the gold knob black wood stick in his clean, soft-looking hand. Maybe it was just a long cane, but it might also be a magician's staff. Indeed, as Nikos peered closer, the fact that the small man was entirely dry argued for the latter. Shall I go, or shall I show my face, the newcomer said, or do you know me? He spoke like an educated man. Nikos didn't recognize the voice. I know you, Kes growled. And I told you to stay away. I'll handle this. As I recall, the stranger said, you didn't want me to look for your rebellious hireling all by myself. 
for fear I'd find him, then decide to cut you out of profit. It occurred to me, however, that if we locate him together, you won't have cause to concern, so here I am. I'm wearing a disguise, and I left home stealthily through the exercise of my art. The same way I entered here, without the bother of persuading your guards to admit me. I will, I will all, it will all be fine, and even if it's not, it's my worry about, it's my worry more than yours. If something happens to you, said Chesk, you won't be able to pay me, nor will, will I should we fail to recover the prize. In that case, there won't be anything to pay for. Nikos was still in so much pain that it was difficult to follow the conversation. Yet even so, he gradually figured out that the stranger who became was the rich man who hired Kes to steal the coffin. I told you, said Kes, I'll find it. Will you? My sources inform me you can't lay hands on our quarry even when he's robbing one of your own enterprises. Having figured out who the small man was, Nikos could think of one reason why Kesk wanted to get rid of him and why Sephiris had concerned herself among the common ruffians. The two of them had conspired against the stranger and didn't want to give him the chance to find out. The Tanarooks The Tanarook looked as if the newcomer the newcomer's last observation had so irked him that he scarcely cared any longer. He shuddered and chuckled and chucked away the remains of the sausage to grip his axe with both fists. Are you mocking me? he demanded. Of course not, the stranger said. His mild, cultured voice said, said his mild cultured voice steadily. He seemed almost as unflappable as Cephas. I'm simply pointing out the na na that now, even more than ever, it is in your best interest to let me assist you. I can think of several reasons why you'd be reluctant, but as the man with the cane nattered on, Nikos had a sudden horrifying inspiration. He could ruin Kesk and Sephri's deception simply by speaking out. The idea terrified him after what he had already suffered at their hands. The last thing he wanted to do was attract their renewed attention, let alone infuriate them. Yet, he despised himself for his dread. He yearned to defy it. Would it do any good, though? He didn't understand enough to foresee the consequences of such an action. He did, however, have a good reason to fear that if matters continued as they were, Aaron 
of doom. Apparently, his son had enjoyed remarkable success in evading the Red Axes, then taking the fight to them. But it wouldn't last. A, it wouldn't last. A lone thief, no matter how cunning or deft with a knife, couldn't oppose Weevil's most powerful gang for long. But maybe, if Nico's sabotaged relations among the boy's enemies, his chances would somehow improve. If so, he had to try, not only because he loved Aaron, but because it was his fault the lad was in danger. Oh, conceivably, action might have become an outlaw anyhow. No, oh, conceivably, Aaron might have become an outlaw anyhow. He'd always had a taste for excitement in the pouty life of the gutter and the underwear. Still, Nikos thought he'd, he'd sealed the son's, his son's fate by getting himself crippled. From that point onward, Aaron had become the family's sole support and there had been no honest way for a boy so young to earn as much coin as was required. Nico screwed up his courage and cried out to the man with the cane, or rather he tried. His throat was still so dry and raw. His voice was feeble, that it was inaudible even to him. He swallowed and tried again. This time he heard the frail little throat, but no one else paid any attention. In desperation, he thrashed in the legs of his chair, bumping and squeaking against the floor. Finally made some significant noise. The other people in the room regarded him with some surprise. He understood why. Once ruffians thereafter, such mistreatment typically left a victim a cowed and pat and as cowed and passive as a piece of furniture. Who's this? asked the small man. Just someone who crossed me, Kes said. He didn't seem too upset that Nikos had stirred. He must not have any notion of what his hostage intended to do. Wizard, Nikos replied. If that is what you are, you have to listen to me. Do I? The small man shrugged and said, Then I'd better move closer. As it is, I can barely hear you, because call I can I can barely hear you. Kess smoldered eyes narrowed. Perhaps he felt a sudden un easiness, an inkling that Nikos could be, cause him some actual inconvenience. Surely, the tenor growled, you don't need to hear the wretch grovel for his life. I, I'll have somebody shut him up so we can palaver in peace. Don't haste, the stranger replied. The feral, the fer, ferule of his walking stick clicked on the floor as he ambled in Nico's direction. Perhaps it would be 
worthwhile to hear what he has to say. It will be for you, Nico said. Kesk has sold you out. I overheard the whole thing. The Tanneric sprang up from his seat and brandished his battle axe at his captain. By the war maker, he said, hold your lying tongue or I'll split your skull here now. Is it a lie? said the man with the cane. Of course it is, Kesk snarled. Who would I sell you out? Of course it is, Kesk snarled. Who would I sell you out to? Your rival? Why? He couldn't afford to give me as much as you promised. He definitely wouldn't pledge to make the Red Axes supreme over all other gangs in Weevil and keep the Grey Blades from troubling us ever again. Sephiri shifted just inside Nikos' field of vision, stepping so stealthily that the small man probably hadn't even noticed. Her change of expression was just as subtle. Her claim, inscrutable, express her his her calm, inscrutable expression was essentially just the same as ever. Yet something in her steady gaze conveyed the promise of hideous retribution if he continued on his present course. It nearly intimidated him, but not quite. It felt too good to strike back at his tormentors, no matter what the eventual cause. Kesk is conspiring with the woman there, Nikos indicated Cephas with a nod and continued. She's a Shar worshiper, a monk or nun, whatever you call the woman of the dark, the women of the dark. I imagine you know your treasure was plunder taken from one of the cult's hidden temples. They sent her to get it back. Liar, said Kess. She's just another red axe. Fair enough, said the man in the green cloak. I suppose then that she wears your brand. She just joined. The Tanneran said, we haven't gotten around to it. The stranger reached into one of the pockets of his mantle, produced a copper piece, and made it vanish and reappear like a mount, a mount bank performing on a street corner. He murmured in an he, he murmured an incantation behind his scarf, and magic sighed through the, the air. Well, now, the wizard muttered, what, Kess asked. I'm listening to other people's thoughts. The prisoner here, yours, the tanner, jerk, and did it and did his axe, and he said, How dare you? Oh, calm down. I'm the one with a legitimate grievance, because it's all true. Dark Sister Sephiris is an agent of Dark Moon, and you and she have been plotting behind my back. The only reason I'm not more upset is that 
you haven't yet decided which of us you truly mean to betray. I'm afraid the time has come to choose. I can, can't continue our arrangement until I'm sure I can trust you. If I decide against you, merchant, you won't leave this house alive. I assumed as much. You, you could have killed me back in my study, and you were alone then. I'm certain you, your henchmen, and the dark sister working together can manage the job. But I'm still willing to press the issue to see it resolved. So be it, Sephiroth says. Kesh, I've told you what I offer. A fortune in gems and the guarantee of future aid from the secret society feared the world over for its power in God. Show me the jewels, the Tanneron said. Show me just one of them. I don't have any of them on my person, Sephiroth said. But they're real enough, I assure you. She's lying, the wizard said. I can see it in her mind. Kest snorted a nasty, persigned sound. Slobber brown from the sausage dripped down his chin. What else would you say, the Tanarok challenge, when you're trying to turn me against her? Well, said the mage, consider this, then. I may be a scoundrel by some people's standards, but I'm not lunatic enough to worship the dark goddess. She is. Which of us is likely to prove more dependable? I saw power, Sephiroth said to Kesh, and took it where I found it. I didn't believe we're so different in that regard. Maybe not the Tanarak admitted. You defer in at least one way, said the man with the cane. She's an outlander. She came to Weevil for the black bouquet. And when she has it, she'll leave. At that point, what becomes of any promises she made what becomes of any promises she made you? Why should she keep them or spare you another thought? I, on the other hand, am like you. I live in the city. I built, I built something here, and will hot and will bide here the rest of my days to enjoy and protect it. That means it's in my best interest to deal, deal fairly with you. If I don't, you can always find me to retaliate. That makes sense, said Kes, but this is twice you tried to muck around inside my head with magic. I don't like it either time. I didn't like it either times. I don't like emeralds and ghost stones. Leering, he lifted his axe, then suddenly pivoted and struck at Sephiroth. She skipped back out of range, and the weapon whizzed harmlessly past her. Her foot snapped out and caught Kesk in the chest, despite the squad. Massive, despite the squat massiveness of him, 
The attack slammed him staggering backwards. Get her, the Tanarak roared. The red axes snatched out their knives and swords and rushed in. Nikos wouldn't have imagined that anyone could survive such an onslaught, but Sephiroth dodged and sidestepped and predict unpredictably. When the red axes veered to compensate, they stumbled into one another's way. Somehow, her hands and forearms deflected sharp steel without being cut, while her punches, elbow strikes, and kicks thud thuddled home to stun or injure one or bugbear or human assailant after another. As she fought, she gradually retreated towards the row of windows. In her place, Nikos would have done the same. It was the best escape route available. She was nearly there when the small man reached inside his mantle, produced a silver dirt, brandished it, and chanted words of power. Another knife, this one made of blue light, shimmered into existence, floating in the air before him. At first, it was that so vague and ghostly that Nikos could hardly make out what it was supposed to be, but it became more clearly defined, somehow more real, by this second. Nikos surmised that in another instant, when it was substantial enough, it would fly at Sephiroth and attack her. The monastic simultaneously ducked the swing of the scimitar rattled off a rhyme and swirled her hand through the mystic pass, through a mystic pass. The floating knife blinked out of existence like a puff-out candle flame. She then shifted in close to the red axe with the scimitar grabbed him by the sword arm, pivoted and flying him at the row of windows. The outlaw crashed through one of the panes and plummeted out of sight. Tusk had been maneuvering frantically trying to bull his way past his own men and get to Sephiroth. When she tossed the swordsman through the glass, she finally cleared a path. The Tanneric charged in and swung his axe. Nikos was sure that if the weapon connected, it would kill her. Her sorceress and combat skills notwithstanding. Even a warrior in plate armor couldn't have withstood such couldn't couldn't have withstood that mighty child. Her ex her expression as calm as ever, Sephiri swayed back, backward like a reed in a breeze, and the stroke missed. She hooked Kesk's ankle with her foot and jerked his, and jerked his leg out from under him, staggering him for a moment. 
She used the time to scurry to the broken window where a few triangular shards of glass still hung around the priming. She dived through the opening head first. Nikos assumed that agile as she was, she managed a safe plunge into the river below. For a second, the red axes and the wizard in green simply stared at the shattered window as if unable to believe Sephiroth had truly succeeded in escaping. Kesk, Kesk roared, useless, useless, the lot of you. Split flew, no, spit flew from his mouth. His men quailed before his anger, or rather, most of them did. Sephiroth had kicked one skinny fellow in the head early on, after which he'd lain un unsensible on the floor. That one lifted himself up on one elbow and rubbed his temple. What? He mumbled, drooled a little bit. What happened? You let her get away, Kesk replied. Just like Aaron. Just like everybody. He charged. The battle axe hurled down and splat and split the humans pinched petulant looking face from scalp to chin. The tannera wrenched the weapon free, spattering blood and brains in the process. Find them, the tannera commanded. Aaron, Sir Randell, and that monk bitch, too. Most of the rebel axes, even those still dazed or in pain from Cephas's attack, hastily exited the room. It's unfortunate the monastic escape, said the man in green. But, the important thing is that we kept our partnership from foundering. Kess spun around, facing and grumbled, you miserable. You're supposed to be a wizard, but you were just as worthless as the rest of them. I'm sorry about that, but I'm not a battle mage. Just a dilettante. When you get right down to it, I don't have any experience fighting other spellcasters. Whereas Sephiroth manife manifestly does. She dispelled my sending before I could uh, send it. If need be, I'll do better next time. Meanwhile, we mustn't lose sight of the fact that our objective is still to lay hands on the bouquet. The chase. Not chase a char worshipper around town. I wish I'd never heard of the cursed book. For you. You won't say that when it makes you the richest, most powerful outlaw in the border kingdoms. Sephiroth's gems were just a fantasy, but the joyous tomorrow you and I are going to share is quite real. It had been it, it had better be. 
short and burly as he was, the tamarack only had to stoop a little to stick his wild boar face close to Nico's. Now, old man, you're going to learn a lesson about speaking out of turn. What Sefri's put you through is nothing compared to what I'm going to do. Nikos was pleasantly surprised to discover that, for whatever reason, he wasn't frightened. He, s he censored back at his captor, go ahead. It's like the shark this told you. I won't have to endure it for long. My heart will give out under the strain. Kess backhanded Nikos across the face, but only once. Then he wrenched himself away. 